Imagine that you're boating on a lake with a friend, enjoying the weather. The day seems perfect, until suddenly, you hear an explosion, and become aware of a bad odor filling the air with the smell of rotten eggs. At the same time, in the distance, you realize a large tsunami wave is headed towards you, and the temperature has risen. Before you know it, you're struggling to get enough oxygen into your lungs. As you try to breathe, you turn to your friend, only to be met with a terrifying sight of their eyes bulging out of their sockets. What comes next are hallucinatory visions and dizziness, before you eventually black out. It sounds like something from a horror movie, doesn't it? But this is the real result of a phenomenon known as exploding lakes. Scientifically, they're known as limnic eruptions or lake overturns, but unlike the eruptions of Old Faithful at Yellowstone National Park, they're far from harmless. Limnic eruptions are not only dangerous, they're responsible for thousands of human fatalities. So what exactly just happened in the nightmare scenario I just described? Well, when limnic activity occurs, it releases a cloud of carbon dioxide, or CO2, which is responsible for suffocating any humans, animals, or wildlife that happens to be in the vicinity. The gas cloud lasts for hours, which is more than enough time to be deadly to a human, considering that the brain can only withstand six minutes without oxygen. And if suffocation wasn't bad enough, the release of gas can also cause CO2 poisoning, which, rather gruesomely, turns your bodily fluids acidic. This results in pressure ulcers or blisters on the skin. But the destruction doesn't end there. Limnic eruptions have also been known to cause tsunamis, leading to huge waves due to the displacement of water by the released CO2. In recent history, lakes Manown and Neos and Cameroon are notable examples of exploding lakes and show the extent of the damage that limnic activity can cause. Both of these events were among the worst natural disasters seen in the 1980s, responsible for the deaths of over 1,900 people and 3,500 animals. We'll take a look at these cases in more detail later. So what exactly is a limnic eruption? It's a rare type of natural disaster, which occurs when CO2, which is trapped deep at the bottom of a lake, erupts into a column of gas which pushes upwards. Limnic eruptions occur under very specific circumstances. There will often be a trigger which dislodges the CO2 trapped deep underwater, causing it to spurt up and out of the surface of the lake. This is the reason that limnic eruptions are also known as lake overturns, because the water which was once at the bottom of the lake is now displaced at the top. Essentially, a limnic eruption is similar to what happens when you open a bottle of fizzy drink. Like an exploding lake, the drink contains gas, which is constantly under pressure. In the lake, the gas has been dissolved into the water and remains down in the depths whilst under pressure from the water above. But when this pressure is removed, perhaps due to an earthquake or something similar like a landslide, the gases will start to bubble out. Of course, the worst that can happen when a fizzy drink bubbles over is that you might spill some of it. But when this happens with a lake, there are deadly consequences. The cause of limnic eruptions is a matter that has perplexed scientists, but they're often thought to be the result of local volcanic activity or earthquakes. Even without human involvement, the earth rumbles and moves on its own accord. This is not something that we can control. What is certain is that the CO2 which is present at the bottom of limnically active lakes has to get there somehow. One way is through the decaying of organic life forms. The process of decaying would release carbon dioxide, which would dissolve in the cold temperatures of the depths of the lakes and remain trapped down there due to water pressure. Of course, the same could be said for minor volcanic activity or a small earthquake. These would both result in a change of temperature and pressure at the bottom of the lake, triggering an eruption. Though, with only two instances of limnic eruptions being reported in human history, it's a difficult case to solve. But how can we spot which lakes could potentially become exploding ones? Do they all have this ability? Well, there are some particular features of limnically active lakes we can look out for. For one thing, they need to have incoming water, which is saturated with CO2. There must also be cool temperatures at the bottom of the lake, which occurs if there's no direct volcanic interaction. However, the lake must be in close proximity to areas with volcanic activity. This is because, as mentioned earlier, volcanic activity is one of the main triggers that will release the toxic gas cloud. Such was a possible cause of the disasters at Lake Manown and Lake Neos. When they exploded in 1984 and 1986 respectively, the devastation wrought was massive. The eruption at Lake Neos alone was responsible for the asphyxiation of over 1,700 local villagers, with a reported release of up to 300,000 tons of CO2. 
The gas cloud rose at almost 62 miles per hour and sped down the valley, covering the towns of Cha, Neos, and Saboom. A local villager reported hearing what he thought was a rock slide before noticing a white mist beginning to rise up from the lake. All those within 25 kilometers of the lake were affected as the gas cloud descended and engulfed surrounding areas, final victim living 27 kilometers from the eruption site. The silence was deafening. Birds and insects now suffocated no longer made a sound. The bodies of the victims lay lifeless. Even the flies were dead. Gas expulsion even blew the very water out of the lake, generating an 80-foot tsunami which ripped away the surrounding shrubbery. When the eruption had occurred at Lake Manown two years earlier, villagers had reported hearing a loud bang before finding 37 people dead on the dirt track close to the lake. The vegetation surrounding the lake had also been flattened, suggesting that, as in Neos, the eruption caused a tsunami. Since the gas is largely invisible, it's very difficult to investigate limnic eruptions in centuries past. However, there is some evidence of limnic activity in the early Eocene. This was a period in the Cenozoic era that ended around 33.9 million years ago. Studies of fossils in the Messel Pit in Germany provided some insight, with victims of CO2 release ranging from frogs and insects to crocodiles and early primates. So what can be done about limnic eruptions? Is there a way to prevent these disasters from happening in the future? Well, the answer may be something known as controlled degassing. And it's not the same thing you do to your dad after a trip to Taco Bell. Controlled degassing is a lot more scientific than that, but just as necessary. After the catastrophic event of the 1980s, Lakes Manown and Neos were monitored closely. They were reported to have an incredible recharge rate for CO2, meaning that their gas saturation levels had returned to around 97% by 2003. It was therefore very likely that it could erupt again. Because of this, controlled degassing was undertaken at Lake Manown in 2003 and Lake Neos in 2001. This process involved extracting the CO2 from the lakes through the use of a pipe, which is set up vertically between the bottom of the lake and the surface. This siphons saturated water from the lower layers of the lake upwards, allowing the CO2 to leak out at safe levels and prevent large-scale eruptions. After the initial degassing at Neos, two further tubes were added in 2011 with the assurance that it would completely degas the lake. The procedure was initially met with speculation that it could, in itself, dislodge CO2 and cause an eruption. However, experiments at Lake Neos in 1992 showed effectiveness of the process, and the degassing went ahead. For its own part, the degassing pipe which was installed at Lake Manown in 2003 was met with great early success, with the pump eventually being switched off. Unfortunately, researchers in 2005 discovered that gas was not being removed quickly enough to prevent likelihood of a future eruption event. It was suggested that the existing pipe should be lowered further into the water, and an additional pipe should be added. This advice was actioned in 2006. It is now widely believed by experts that another eruption is probably not possible there, because the lake is almost completely degassed. There's some other good news there, too. It has been suggested that the gas produced by these exploding lakes could potentially be harvested for human benefit. As mentioned in a 2015 article in MIT Technology Review, Extracting the methane from limnically active lakes could increase electricity gathering capacity. In fact, a whole 960 megawatts of it. This was the solution proposed by Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, who both face massive power shortages. Fortunately, or not fortunately, depending on how you look at it, there is a lake which straddles both countries, which could eventually become a home to a limnic eruption. Lake Kivu has approximately 60 billion cubic meters of methane, and 300 billion cubic meters of carbon dioxide dissolved within it. This means that not only does harnessing these gases benefit energy supplies, it also prevents a monumentally destructive limnic eruption. Lake Kivu contains 1,000 times more gas than Lake Neos did, with the potential for a much bigger death toll to boot. There are more than 2 million people living near the potential blast radius, who would all be killed if even a small portion of the CO2 was released in a limnic eruption. Luckily, the process of extraction has gained speed after decades of stilted progress, and the Rwandan government has since negotiated with a number of external parties to produce methane from the lake. One such party is the Symbion Power Lake Kivu LTD, who hope to begin construction of a power plant there in 2019. Their aim is to produce up to 75 megawatts of power utilizing the Lake Kivu methane resource, with the first supplies released to the local energy grid in 2020. So, would you risk having a limnically active lake nearby if it could be used to harness energy? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below, and thanks for watching.